I remember doing media training for the very first time. And that was when I was about to sign my record deal with Universal. So about two and a half years ago. And um, right before I was going in, I was kind of nervous because it's like four or five hours of just practicing interviews, which is very like nerve wracking because you're like, I'm saying the right thing. They're judging me the whole time, you know, like it's pretty scary. But I remember being on camera and the, um, the coach asked me something and I like said something and I stopped halfway and I was like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. Like, let me start over. I'm so sorry. And she's like, why are you apologizing? I'm like, because I messed up. And she was like, Kylie, like you're human. Like that's normal. Like if you're in an interview and you don't know the answer to the question then literally be like, can I just take a second? Like, I'm so sorry. I'm so flustered. Like, she's like, that's okay. Like people know that you're a human being. And I literally was like, oh, really? <laughs> like it just gave me that moment of like, I tried so hard to be perfect all growing up. And then finally that light bulb went off. And honestly, that really derived a lot from releasing songs like Break Things and Cuss a Little because it completely gave me a new perspective to honestly air out my mistakes and knowing that I'm a human being and not perfect rather than trying to hide them. So it really gave me a new perspective. All right, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I am super fired up today to have the one and only Kylie Morgan. I just want to start by saying, Kylie, thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Thanks so much for having me. It gives us an excuse to hang out, so I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. I appreciate you uh, spending a little bit of time during your busy day. Um, so to int introduce you a little bit, Kylie, you're from Newcastle, Oklahoma. Um, you're one of the brightest young uh, up-and-coming country stars here in Nashville. Uh, you spent the last kind of decade touring the country and honing in on your skills and your artistry and your poised for a breakout debut record in 2021 with Universal Music Group. And you just came out with a new song called Cuss a Little um, and kind of after a, another new song, newer song called Break Things, which has been uh, blowing up and absolutely love the new music that you've been putting out. So excited to get into a lot of that stuff today. But to kind of backtrack to start things off, you started writing songs when you were kind of like 12 years old and you started releasing some music in, in your early teens. So what was kind of the biggest thing that got you started with music? Were your fam was your family big into music or what kind of got you started? Sure. So there was quite a few aspects. Um, a main one was the fact that uh, my grandfather was a musician. My mom was a musician. Um, and my grandpa was actually the very first person to buy me a guitar. So I owe that to him. But honestly, what really got me started is I was absolutely obsessed with Shirley Temple. So I would watch all of those videos when I was little and I would like run to my dress up drawer and like find something that looked like she was wearing and I would just put on shows for my parents in the living room and they kind of knew that they had an entertainer on their hands at that point. <laughs> and then growing up, um, really another big influence for me was Shania Twain. When she came out with the Up CD, it was like half pop, half country. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. And um, I learned my first song on guitar and wrote my first song on guitar. And then after I did that, I immediately walked into the, the living room where my mom was and I was like, mom, I'm skipping college and I'm going to be a country music artist. So I'm moving to Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, oh, are you now? But hey, here we are, you know, um, 10 years later and um, I did it. So uh, yeah, it's been a journey, but it's been so worth it. Yeah, no, I'm sure. So I'm sure there's probably also a lot of little girls out there that probably are pretty similar to you in the sense that they maybe had a guitar or they started writing songs. They like singing songs. They like performing in front of their family and stuff like that. But at what point, and, and like you said, when you were young, you said like, I know I want to be a, be a music star, but at what point are you like kind of old enough and you're actually like, okay, this is definitely what I'm going to go pursue. Was there ever like a moment like that? Or do you, was it actually just always like, I knew I was going to do this thing? You know, that's a great question. And I will say that when I was younger, I always knew what I wanted to do. Um, right after I started learning and writing um, songs, that's when I kind of knew that it was something more than just a hobby. But I will say um, when Taylor Swift first came out and she was 16, um, that gave me a whole new perspective as in like, I don't need to wait till I'm like 19, 20 to kind of start this whole journey. And so um, I started really, really young, um, signed my first indie record deal at 14 and started touring the country 
um, at 14 and a half. <laughs> so after then, I really like just gave me kind of a head start and was able to really establish an amazing group and community of people that I wanted in my life, wanted in my career, was able to meet some incredible people at a very young age that helped me get to where I am now. And so um, thankfully, since Taylor came out so young, it gave me that niche of, you know, I don't have to wait till I'm older to start. So I just started really young and have been building ever since. Yeah, I think, um, I feel like, in a sense, to phrase it differently, I feel like it kind of gave, gave you permission to like, oh, this is something that I that I can do as well. So signing something at 14 and a half, signing your first deal at 14 and a half years old and starting to tour around the country at that age. I can't even imagine like 15 year old me doing anything similar to that. So what, <laughs> what was, what was that like at 14, 15, 16, 17 years old to be doing that? Like when a lot of your friends were probably not doing that at all and just kind of having a more traditional upbringing, if you will. Yeah, it was honestly, it was the funnest time. Um, my mom and I would just go, it's pretty much doing mother daughter trips like all the time. And I just happened to be performing and getting paid to do them. And so um, growing up that way was a lot different than um, obviously everybody else was going to high school and going to football games and, you know, doing all the things you're supposed to be doing in high school. But um, having a mom that was also my best friend really gave me a different perspective because I, my best friend was 23 years older than me. And so like, since we spent so much time together, she never treated me like a child. She was just very much instilling like, um, just good as like knowing what's right and what's wrong. And more of like, if you're doing this, I'm disappointed in you more than mad at you. You know, that like word that parents say that just like crush you. Yeah. And so ever since then, like it really was one of those things where I was just, I knew what I wanted so young and I was willing to sacrifice absolutely anything to get it. And so I had the opposite of a regular childhood, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because I've, even though I'm 25, I've gotten to do so many amazing things and gotten to travel so many places and have had so many experiences um, thus far that I wouldn't trade for anything. Yeah. So kind of on the, on that same tune, do you feel like you said you you kind of feel like you got a little bit of a head start, a jump start to be able to do that at such a young age? Do you feel like there's any like particular lesson in particular that you learned from having done it at such a early age? that you wouldn't have done, that you wouldn't have gotten if you didn't do it that young? Yes, I will say um, I had one of those light bulb moments. You know, you have like a few of them in your life that really kind of give you a new perspective. And I remember all growing up, I just, especially being in the industry, I had so many eyes on me. And so like, I mean, I would absolutely do anything in my power to make sure there was no negative light um, bestowed on me, especially since I was so young, I wanted to be a good example. And so I remember doing media training for the very first time. And that was when I was about to sign my record deal with Universal. So about two and a half years ago. And um, right before I was going in, I was kind of nervous because it's like four or five hours of just practicing interviews, which is very like nerve wracking because you're like, I'm saying the right thing. They're judging me the whole time, you know, like it's pretty scary. But I remember being on camera and the, um, the coach asked me something and I like said something and I stopped halfway and I was like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. Like, let me start over. I'm so sorry. And she's like, why are you apologizing? I'm like, cause I messed up. And she was like, Kylie, like you're a human. Like that's normal. Like if you're in an interview and you don't know the answer to the question and literally be like, can I just take a second? Like, I'm so sorry. I'm so flustered. Like, she's like, that's okay. Like people know that you're a human being. And I literally was like, oh, really? <laughs> like, it just gave me that moment of like, I tried so hard to be perfect all growing up. And then finally, that light bulb went off. And honestly, that really derived a lot from releasing songs like Break Things and Cuss a Little, because it completely gave me a new perspective to honestly air out my mistakes and knowing that I'm a human being and not perfect rather than trying to hide them. So it really gave me a new perspective. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's something I feel like I've learned probably a, a similar thing growing up. I think when you're in high school and in college, you think that people who are older than you and have big boy jobs or big girl jobs have it all figured out. And you think like, oh my gosh, I don't have all the answers. I'm just winging it right now. But then like you kind of realize like everybody else is kind of winging it as well. Um, and and they, don't, they don't have all the answers either. And I think that's the best way to look at life because at the end of the day, like, what fun would it be if we were all just like perfect robots that just went around and did exactly what we were supposed to do? Like, that sounds really boring. <laughs> so now looking back, I'm like, why did I always aim for that? Like, 
I had my funnest moments and my worst mistakes. So I love keeping that mantra and just continuing to build that. Yeah, no doubt. I'll never forget. I, I interviewed like a 92 year old former NFL referee who was an NFL referee for like 37 years or something. And I called, I talked to him on the phone before our podcast interview and he was asking me about myself and what I was doing. And I was telling him how I'm in Nashville doing this, doing that, just trying to figure things out. And he's like, well, I'm going to just stop you right there. He's like, I'm 92 and I'm still trying to figure things out. So don't feel yeah. like, <laughs> he's like, don't feel like you have, I know, I know. I, I literally remember I was, I was driving right by like the eighth Avenue circle, right downtown by like the Yeehaw brewery when I was on the phone. And I was like, that was awesome. I was, yeah. like, I was like, that was great. There you go. Yeah. Um, but so with, with performing and uh, you, you get to interact with so many different kinds of people and all different kinds of cities, all ages, all everything. And with different, like doing different song rights and interacting with so many different people here in Nashville. What I'm getting at is you've just had the experience of interacting with so many different people. Over that time, what do you think are maybe the couple of the biggest things that you've learned that is so important in order to really connect with somebody else, whether it be an audience member, whether it be something that you're riding with, whoever. Right. Well, I love what you just said, um, but I'll kind of elaborate on it even more. I, I think that you can relate to this as well, because I am very much a people person and I think you are too, which is why you started this podcast. So you can like just connect more with people and spend more time with people and kind of learn their story. And I'm very much the same way. Like it's kind of, honestly, it's kind of hard for me to do um, some of these podcasts and talk about myself for so long because I just want to hear about other people and I want to know about them. And, and my biggest thing is I feel like I will forever be learning just like that 92 year old man. He still doesn't have it figured out. I think if you keep the mentality of constantly being that sponge and trying to still aim for that wide eyed kid and like remembering the reason why you began all this and holding on to that while learning from anyone and absolutely everyone you can who can bestow something on you like that, even in your worst. I mean, I know that I've had so many like bad co-writes or like frustrating performances or, you know, whatever the may the valley may have been, but I absolutely every single time learned something from that. And so I think my biggest thing that I have tried to remind myself even today, because obviously I don't have it figured out, but I just always want to learn from somebody and I want to hear their story and feel like that I can get something out of every situation that will kind of change my perspective and give me a new light on something even later on in life, if it's something that I don't even use right then. But um, I definitely think that that's something that I continue to remind myself. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, I've definitely become, become the same way the last few years. Actually, the quote that I read that kind of sparked me to, to start this podcast was a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that reads, every man is in some way my superior and in that I can learn of him. And I was like, whoa. I was like, all I want to do is interview other people and see how they are my superior and learn from them and, and uh, be able to implement it in my life and be able to share it with others. Um, so I think that's awesome. But um, is there a show or performance or audience member or anything like that that you felt like you learned the most from, Where whether it was maybe a bad one or a good one, like, oh, they love this or they don't like that or I need to be, yeah. I need to connect with them this particular way? You know what? Every time I go out with another artist um, to open up for, I've been very lucky enough to open up for, you know, Kit Moore, Dan and Shay, um, I even did this um, rhyming performance where I was on the same stage as Carrie Underwood and Luke Bryan and Keith Urban. And I've gotten all these amazing, incredible opportunities that I have manifested and dreamed about for years. And I have just realized from that, that like even watching performances or even interactions with people, I have realized that like genuine always wins no matter how unattainable you are or how big you are or how small you are. And one of the moments that really stuck with me forever, I actually, my very first concert I ever went to was someone named Kelly Coffey. And um, she uh, was huge in the music scene um, in the early 2000s. And I was a huge fan of her. She actually grew up with my mom. And so um, she, I always had that kind of connection, but um, she was my very first concert and I was just so excited and so happy. and full circle moment, I asked her, she started to give voice lessons when she retired and was a mom and staying in Oklahoma. And so I asked her to give me a couple of voice lessons before I made my way out to Nashville. So I was around like 18, almost 19. And um, 
she told me it was our second voice lesson and she told me she goes you know what Kylie I have nothing else to show you like I I think that you're ready and that moment was like if someone else that's like has been at the level I want to be at can admit that and completely like surrender that I have nothing else to teach you that is such a cool moment alone but I will never forget the day that I left there she goes you know Kylie you have to remember that you have to be present to win Mm -hmm. So you need to be in Nashville. You need to be there. You need to be in it. You need to be networking. You need to be meeting people. You need to fail. Like, but you just need to be there. And so ever since then, like I knew the right move was moving to Nashville. Gotcha. Gotcha. Is that, were you, were you kind of, I, I know you kind of moved at like age 19. Was that a more like, I'm done with high school now. I want to do this. Or was that kind of the thing that sparked it? Or was it just, what was kind of the deciding factor on moving? Yeah, so I started traveling back and forth to Nashville at 15 to mm -hmm. co-write songs, and I was so lucky enough and blessed to have some incredible writers that agreed to write with a 15-year-old, first of all. Um, one of them was a guy named Walker Hayes, who is on my current single, Cuss a Little, and then um, people like Rob Crosby, who wrote Concrete Angel by Martina McBride, which is one of my all-time favorite songs, and then people like Liz Hangber, um, who has written a lot of Reba hits and has quite a few books and done cuts, and and um, I just was immediately surrounded by such a family already at such a young age. And so I was traveling back and forth so much that I knew it was just a matter of time until I moved. And so I honestly was stuck in this indie record deal that I could not get out of that I signed when I was 14 years old and took a lot of attorney fees and a lot of my patience to finally wow. get out of. But I was just waiting to finally be done with that so that way I can make the move and I signed my first publishing deal out here in Nashville at 19 and knowing that I moved there with a deal because of all the pre-work that I did traveling back and forth was way more of a relief for not only be for not only me but my parents who was like all right little one like fly away from the nest and yeah. and um, I was able to fly away knowing where I was going to land which was very very comforting and so um, at 19 I I saved up all the money that I made touring uh, till thus far, and I bought my first house out here and decided that there wasn't going to be a turning back. There wasn't going to be like, all right, mom, I've been here for a year. I want to go home. Like, I wanted to, like, stake my roots in Nashville, buy a house, and, like, call it home and start from there. No, I think that's awesome, that, that last part. Because I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this thing out. I'm going to try my dream out or whatever for a year or two. And if it's not it's not done by then, then I'm going to go to plan B. But one of the coolest things that I heard is I got to interview a guy named Casey Neistat for a few minutes who is a kind of a big YouTube personality. And I asked him kind of like what was his superpower, what allowed him to be so consistent in releasing so many of these videos. And he was like, honestly, I didn't have a plan B. He was like, I feel bad for people who have a plan B because if you have that fallback, that's just going to like – hinder how much action that you take. It's so true. And I get so many people who, you know, message me on Instagram, especially like from Oklahoma, who have kind of seen me and pretty much have been like, how do I do what you're doing? Because I want to do that. And do you have any advice? And literally the first thing that I ask, like, I don't even give any advice. The first thing that I ask is, are you 1 million percent sure you want to do this? And do you have a plan B? And if they say, yes, I have a plan B, then I'm like, then it's not made for you. Because it is literally the biggest sacrifice, the biggest like mountain you will forever climb. No matter what like is your destination, it will forever be a mountain. And trying to, if you make it on top, it's now it's about staying on top. Like it's, it's one of those things that I, I can never imagine doing anything else. And I was like, if you can ever imagine doing anything else, then this is not your life. And so I think that's a beautiful way to put it is if, you don't have a plan B, then this is for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's powerful for sure. And I think that's a good piece of advice to make sure you weed out the people who really are not 100% committed. And so on, on the on the topic of advice, if you will, like you said, you've written with a lot of different people and been around so many different people and built a great network here in Nashville. Is there any one or maybe two pieces of advice that stand out to you from a, some sort of mentor or some sort of other peer that was maybe a really important piece of advice that you took action on and you're like, wow, that was like awesome. Well, I really will. I look up to Walker a lot and I always have looked up to Walker. And when I first met him, he actually had just signed his first major record deal with Capitol. And he was putting out songs that were kind of like 
they would work now, but they were kind of before it was like shifting to that country music was shifting to that. And so all he wanted to do was put out these songs that he kind of was like singing to the future of that the record label was just scared of. And knowing him when he had his record deal and then knowing him when he lost his record deal and then knowing him when he had to get a job at Costco to support his six kids while he was still writing. And now knowing him, now that he signed a monument, he's had you know, a top 20 hit and continues to be able to tour and headline. Like I've seen him through those valleys and through those mountains. And it's, it's a pretty surreal moment to know that like, as hard as you work to get it and as fast as it comes sometimes is the fast that it goes away. Yeah. And so never getting to the point where you feel like, okay, I've made it because like, you've literally never made it. You're like constantly trying to continue to make it. And keeping that mentality of knowing that and realizing that like, you know, you're not this high and mighty person, like you can lose it just as fast as you got it. And so that's what keeps me grounded too, is knowing that like seeing him go through that journey and knowing how grounded he stayed. And that's what I continue to want to do. Yeah, no doubt. I think that, you know, you can hear the message of like, don't get comfortable, don't get complacent, continue to work, continue to work. But having somebody that close to you and being able to see them go through it is probably the ultimate mo the ultimate motivator and and just that much more inspiring to to not get comfortable so i think that's great exactly comfortable boring too yeah <laughs> super boring super boring it's cool for like it's cool for like a few hours or a day or so and then after that it's like all right let's let's do something What's um next? yeah exactly <laughs> exactly right. um so you you touched on before kind of how um being authentic and, and being true to yourself always wins. And that's kind of how a little bit of how you, you approach songwriting and you talk about kind of failing or, and you're, it's not, okay, it's okay not to be perfect, but break things, but cuss a little, these, these sorts of things. But on the topic of songwriting, is there anything in particular that you feel allows you to be most creative or be like the best version of yourself, if you will, in a songwriting? Like, is there any kind of like preparation that you do, any kind of mental state that you have to be in? Just what kind of allows you to be the best songwriter that you can be whenever you go into a songwrite? That's a great question. Um, I will say before any write, I usually like nine times out of 10 do some sort of physical activity, whether it is yoga, whether it's a run, whether it's whatever. I feel like that really kind of gets me into a mental state of like, stress release because that's I'm just like you I feel like that's kind of the stress releaser and as an artist your mind is going one million miles per hour and what even when you I'm answering this question I'm like thinking about the next question like I also have ADHD so there's that but also it's like knowing that you want to be present in that moment and I think that's the biggest thing of that's my most successful co-writes is when I'm not thinking about what's after this or what I have to do after that or like even you know something else that comes across my mind like just like in yoga like if I if I continue to be in that present moment enjoy that person that I'm writing with and being creative with and and really just have time with them because it's a very it's a very vulnerable state going into a co-write and being like hey I want to write about this and this is why because this is what happened to me or like this is what happened to my friend or you know, whatever you're writing about. And it's very therapeutic because after I leave a co-write, when I'm dealing with something, I walk in and I write about it and I leave, I feel like a weight is just lifted off of my shoulders. And it's very similar to, you know, practicing yoga, working out, whatever you come in there with, if you can leave it there and then and then walk away from it. It's a very, it's a very mental clarity moment that can truly, you can use as a tool to continue to create your best work. Yeah, that's awesome. Is there ever, is there a, so, is there a songwriting tip or person that you've learned, learned the most from in regards to how to go about writing in a way that is uniquely you because like you said being like being authentic to yourself is when the best stuff is going to come out is there any is there ever been anything that someone has said to like help you not be afraid to like say something that you might be afraid to say with other people i will say my biggest piece of advice to songwriters is don't be afraid to get personal 
because I have realized that my most successful songs that I have been able to release that everyone has somewhat agreed on and enjoyed have been my most personal things. Like, I think a lot of people and artists go into um, go into co-writes and they're like, you know, what does radio want to hear? Like, what do you know, like, what can we make very generic that way everyone relates to it? And I'm the opposite. I'm like, let's get super personal. And I feel like that's more of a storyteller, which is a songwriter to me than anything. And I'm not afraid of that. And it's also pretty scary because a lot of the times you go in to a co-write and it's the first time that you've met that person. Yeah. So it's literally like, hi, I'm Kylie. Let me tell you my deepest, darkest secrets and let's write a song about right. it. Right, seriously. So it's a very vulnerable state, but it's very therapeutic. And to be able to just completely say what's on your mind, even if you don't care what anyone else thinks or who hears it, then I think it's a pretty, um, it's like, it's one of those things that you can just exhale on. Gotcha. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Like you said, yeah. leave, leave whatever you come in with uh, there, there in the room. Um, to talk about kind of what you're currently working on, is there any current area, whether it be like, your your voice, your songwriting ability, trying to find the best opportunity. Is there anything right now that you're working on that's like, this is what I need to do in order to get to the next level, in order to take the next step, and you're really trying to focus in on that right now? Like maybe it's the voice, maybe it's songwriting ability, maybe it's just like seeking out that right opportunity. What What is that next thing that you're working on to take you to the next level? Honestly, the next thing for me, and it was, it's pretty sad because it was, I thought, I, if this all didn't happen as far as like this year, COVID, all that stuff. I feel like I've, I would have received it this year. Um, but coming up next year, like being on the road as much as possible and gaining as many fans as possible and having a one-on-one -on -one connection with as many people as I can, like that is what I'm working on. And that's my goal is to just spread the, now the art that I've spent so many years to create now that it's created, now that I need, I need to get it to people's ears, you know what I mean? And so continuing to strive to make connections, organic connections, and form relationships with other artists in a way that like, I will hopefully be on, you know, a tour long term next year. And I'm, I'm already booked some um, really major festivals that I'm so thankful for and excited about that they've rescheduled like, um, Faster Horses and Tortuga Festival and um, these ma major mega festivals that I've always wanted to be a part of that I now will next year. And so um, I think that's what I'm working on is to really just be on the road as much as possible and reach as many people as possible. That's awesome. I love it. Kind of goes back to what you were talking about in the beginning, just connecting one-on-one -on -one with as many people so you can uh, kind of learn from, from the experience. So when you were young, you signed the deal when you signed that first music deal when you were 14. You, you know, when you were 16, you were named Who Knew to Watch by Country Music Association. And you're touring around the country as a teenager. And so I feel like because you were so young, there, and you, you are still so young, there's people who have kind of are putting like a high expectation on you right they're like oh this girl's 16 she's already doing this she's already doing that and so they look at you and they're like put place this high expectation on you has that ever affected you in a overly positive way overly negative way or what how have you kind of dealt with high expectations on yourself from other people yeah I would say it's been negative and positive positive because I work my best under pressure um I think that comes from me being a gymnast uh I would always do my best at the gymnastics meet. Um, it's kind of the same thing. I usually always do my best on performance day, um, on video day, whatever it is. Um, I always just thrive under pressure, which is funny because um, that's usually the opposite of what people do, but I, I crave it for some reason. And so people have having high expectations for me actually makes me work harder. Um, which I enjoy people who push me and because um, that's what I constantly surround myself with is a team that consistently pushes me. And um, I think the negative part is the fact that like, I'm, even though I'm 25, like sometimes I already feel old, like, cause I've been doing this for so long. Like I already feel like I should have done X, Y, and Z by now. Um, especially, you know, like seeing these, you know, even younger people than me um, having more success. And I think 
that's the negative part is I truly do know that comparison is the thief of joy and being able to remind myself that each person has a different journey and a different path. And I'm a very spiritual person. And so a lot of the times, you know, I'll be like, I've worked so hard. Why am I not X, Y, and Z? Why am I not here? Why are they there? And I'm not. And then I just take a step back and I realize, first of all, I just, I have absolutely the best job in the whole wide world. It's not even a job to me. Um, if you enjoy your job, you don't work a day in your life. And I don't work. I don't see it as work, which I'm so thankful for and blessed for. Um, but I will say it is very hard to think about like in a negative way, as far as when people put these expectations on you, if you don't meet them, the, the most important person that you disappoint is yourself. And like, that's, that's the worst part of it. But I will say that I think the positive overwhelms the negative and it makes me work harder and continue to try and reach the goal that I'm trying to. Yeah, no, I love that. I feel like I feel very sim similar in the sense that anytime somebody gives me a high expectation, whether it was like in high school playing sports or whether it's now doing whatever, and because someone believes in me or whatever and, w and what I'm doing, it definitely just fuels me like, oh, hell yeah. Like I believe in myself now even a little bit more, but same thing. It's like, ah. Oh gosh, why am I not just there yet? But yeah. I'm, I've gotten better and better at the at the patience with the journey and everything like that. Yeah, I definitely think it's more of like challenge accepted. Yeah, Let's do it. yeah, <laughs> Freak it. yeah, bring it on, bring it on. Yeah. Um, so my goal every single day is to try to gain clarity on what the best version of myself looks like, getting down to the last couple of questions here. So I try to gain clarity on what the best version of myself looks like, what that person is capable of, what that person knows, and then every single day try to reverse engineer that person into reality. And so a question that I found probably six, 12 months ago or so that was really profound for me is one I'm getting ready to ask you is, is there a, any particular skill or piece of knowledge that the best version of yourself has that you don't currently have? Yes. Um, I know that this is something that I am continuing to work on and that I honestly will probably still continue to work on my entire life. Um, it's funny because I am a yoga instructor and you, and I preach this and I don't practice what I preach and I'm still trying to work on that. But my biggest thing is truly just being in the present moment. I am, um, I have a really hard time like just consistently thinking about like, it's I'm one of those people that's on vacation and thinking about the next vacation. Like I'm, I'm one of those people. <laughs> and then my, when I am the best version of myself is when my phone is down, I'm not comparing myself to others. When I'm not thinking about what is next and when I'm truly in that moment with hopefully and usually the people that I love or doing what I love, like that's, one of the things that I continue to strive for because there's been very few moments and far between where I've just literally closed my eyes and just like soaked in like what just happened or what's happening and that truly is one of the things that I will forever work on and I know that but when those moments happen it's the best feeling in the whole world yeah no doubt I love that I love that I think that's a that's definitely a being in the present moment is a skill that probably everybody is currently working on no one will ever master but as long as you're continuing to work on it, that's definitely uh, what's most important and you're aware of it. And that's why I love doing like these podcasts and, and these actually long interviews, not like a, you know, a TV segment or whatever, where you have to hit your belt bullet points and then it's a commercial. I love doing like the long ones because you really get to dive in deep. And like, for me, this is therapy. Like I love just being able to talk through and like, I feel like that every time I step off of one of these, that I learn something new about myself that I didn't know before. And so what a lot of people don't do is this, like have these hour long conversations where we just ask each other about one another. And, and I feel like the world and everyone can kind of use more of that. Yeah, no, I'm glad you said that because I've told people in the past that being present is definitely something that I'm obviously trying to work on as well. But the podcast has been the biggest, the best training ground for me, because if I'm not present and I'm just like sitting here like, my let my mind wander then I'm gonna blank on what to ask next and I'm gonna have no idea what you said so it's been the best training ground and something that I've uh, continually improved upon since I've been doing this over the last couple of years so for sure well I just love that you continue to bring people on that are very like-minded as you um, I've only we don't know each other very well but we've met briefly and we follow each other on Instagram so we might as well be best friends because I know everything about you <laughs> but um it's really cool that you are continuing to like 
bring to light the people that you think um, can really just bestow some wisdom slash like reality and just be the person that they are made to be. And I love that you're continuing to pull that out of people and continuing to show other people that. So I think it's great what you're doing. Yeah, well, well, I appreciate that. Well, before I ask the last question, I want to acknowledge you because I think that doing what you did at 14, 15, 16, 17 is something that not a lot of people would be able to do and would be able to see it in such a positive way that you did. I think a lot of people would probably you know, would complain about it when they were doing it with their, with their mom. Like, I just want to be back with my friends and all this kind of stuff. And I think you had such a a positive outlook on it. And then I also want to acknowledge you for your ability to just be like, I am dead set on making this thing happen. I'm buying a house at 19 years old, which is like absurd to kind of think about. Um, And there's no plan B, I'm making this happen. So I think that's really special and unique. Well, thank you so much. And I, I really owe it all to the person that created me because I know that I would not be where I am today if I did not have my Heavenly Father to fall back on. I have had so many moments where I have just completely been like, what the hell am I doing? Like, and why am I even here? Like, is this even what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, like we all have those doubts. We all have those what ifs, but like truly I know that he has given me these abilities just like he has given you your abilities and, and all we're here for is to, if we change one person's life, if we give one person a new perspective, then I feel like we've done what we're supposed to do. So um, I'm just glad that you've given me the opportunity to, to continue to try and do that and that you do the same. Yeah, of course. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, I know everybody's going to want to make sure they go learn more about you if you're, you're not following her already. Make sure you go to KylieMorganMusic.com. You can find everything there, but you can also follow her on Instagram at Kylie Morgan. She's on Facebook, Kylie Morgan Music, on Twitter at Kylie Morgan. 33 go follow her on youtube spotify apple music all the places um yeah yeah we're pumped to see uh been pumped to see see your new music over the past uh couple weeks and excited to see what more you have in store for us but last question here kylie is i think that getting closer to the best version of ourself is a constant journey and then i also think it's a unique journey i think the way that i'm going to get closer to my best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than how you get closer to the best version of yourself so for you personally If there are three things that you can currently do or three things that you can currently work on to get closer to that best version of Kylie Morgan that you could possibly be, what are the three things that you could currently do or work on? Number one um, is to stop comparing. Um, I think that we all do that, but especially being in the music industry, like you said, each person has a different journey and you know, it's really hard. Even like I'm, I'm dating an artist, my boyfriend, Jay Allen, like it's, we do it all the time. We're like, I'll get something and he'll be like, well, why didn't I get that? Or he'll get something. I'll be like, why didn't I get that? And so I think that is a huge thing that I will forever work on is comparison. Um, Number two, more human connection and more doing more for others. Um, It's really easy for me to get caught up in my own world. Um, When you have something scheduled every 15, 30 minutes, it's really easy to kind of just be kind of blindsided and only look at this. And then I'll have those moments where, you know, I'll see a commercial or where I'll do a show that, you know, um, is for a charity and someone will speak on it. And it just like completely just does this. And I've been like, where have I been the past like three months? You know, I've been like in this own little bubble. So like to continue to like do what you do and just like learn people and learn the struggles of people and respect that. And I feel like it continues to help me with my life and it makes me more grateful for the things that I have. And so I would say that is number two. Number three, hmm, number three, I would say to do more things with absolutely no agenda. So like whether it's just something that's super spontaneous or whether it's something for someone else, um, doing more things knowing that you're not going to get something in return. Um, I think that is big for me. Um, I even, it's crazy because I even started recently, um, tithing again when I've, I mean, I was supposed to make a lot of money this year. A lot of people were, and then, you know, we made no money this year. And so I honestly, I stopped for a little bit and then I was like, why did I stop? Like, this is not okay. So I started tithing again. And then the next week just got so many opportunities financially that really was a return. And so I think that when we do things that we don't feel like we're going to receive back 
that's when the universe does give it back. Mm. And so I think those three things, if I try and just continue to work on those, and I think we can all work on those, but I mean, I just love that you're asking these questions because it forces us to think about the things that can make us a better human being. And I think we can all think about that more. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. That's I, that. my goal is that everybody, every single day, at least once, thinks, okay, like, how can I just get a little bit closer to, to that guy who's down the road? Yeah. But anyway, that's all we got today, Kylie. Three great things. Appreciate you spending the time with me today. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's listening. Um, I try and return every single one of my Instagram DMs. So shoot me a DM. I would love to hear from you guys. Thank you all so much. And Nick, you're wonderful. You're so amazing. I can't wait to finally see you in person soon and do a workout. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Thanks, Kylie. Awesome. See ya.